Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Bergerson, and I'm a patient navigator and patient support and outreach advocate for the Colon Cancer Alliance. And on behalf of the Colon Cancer Alliance and the entire patient support staff team, I'd like to welcome you to CT Colonography, Screening for Colorectal Cancer in 2015, sponsored by our friends at the American College of Radiology and at Medical Imaging and Technology Alliance. This is the fourth segment in the Colon Cancer Alliance's webinar uh, excuse me, uh, series, which we created to provide the opportunity for patients and survivors, caregivers, family members, and friends and healthcare professionals to link with national experts in colorectal cancer and other related fields in an interactive online setting. As a reminder, conversations about colon cancer will occur every third Wednesday of the month from 7 till 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This webinar will be providing you with the basics of colorectal cancer screening by means of a CT colonography, also known as a virtual colonoscopy. The advantages and disadvantages of screening by this imaging-based methodology will be discussed. And in addition, the, the true meaning of the low-dose exposure to medical-related um, radiation related to this exam will be explained, as well as how this screening methodology has the ability to detect unsuspected findings outside of the colon, which is not possible with any other screening exams. Now, before I introduce our speaker, just a quick note here about questions. Uh, we envision this webinar to be interactive where attendees can pose questions to our presenters. If we have time remaining after our speaker has presented, we may be able to address a few of the questions presented by attendees during the webinar. But because of the number of attendees, we're only going to accept questions posted online using the webinar control panel. To submit a question for consideration and possible use, click on the small plus sign located next to the word questions on the webinar control panel located on the right hand side of your screens. Then type in your question and hit enter. The questions will be collected and asked on a time available basis and uh, my apologies in advance if you're unable to, uh, if you're asked a question and we're unable to get to it. Or if your particular question we don't get to at all. And uh, with that I'm going to introduce our speaker. Our speaker tonight is Dr. David Kim, and Dr. Kim graduated from, inter, from the Interflex program from the University of Michigan in 1993. This seven-year combined college and medical school experience resulted in a Bachelor of Science with the highest distinction in biomedical sciences and a Doctorate of Medicine degree, cum laude. He studied internal medicine at the University of Michigan Medical Center, followed by a residency in diagnostic radiology at the Malincroft Institute of Radiology at Washington University in St. Louis in, from 1994 to 1998. Dr. Kim then undertook abdominal imaging fellowship at Duke University. After a several year period in private practice in a subspecialized radiology group, Dr. Kim returned to the academic radiology and joined the abdominal imaging section of the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health in 2005. Since then, he has authored or co-authored over 60 peer-reviewed publications, 35 book chapters, and one reference book, textbook on CT, colonography. This has included first authorship of an original research article on CT colonography published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007. Dr. Kim is an associate editor for the Journal of Abdominal Imaging and currently chairs the Gastroenterology Scientific Program Subcommittee for the Society of Abdominal Radiology and is the past Gastroenterology Scientific Program Subcommittee Chair for the Radiological Society of North America. Dr. Kim helps to direct the CT colonography colorectal cancer screening program at the University of Wisconsin and is the Vice Chair of Education and the Radiology Residency Program Director. He is a fellow of the American College of Radiology and is a strong advocate for resident and fellow education. Dr. Kim, welcome, sir. Thanks, Kevin. Um, 
I'm going to turn the screen over to you now. Okay. There you go. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, Kevin, can you see it? Oh, I think you'll be able to see it now. Here we go. So thanks again. Um, you know, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor to give this lecture on CT colonography, or CTC for short. Um, it's my understanding that there is a pretty wide range in terms of the audience, ranging from an educated general public all the way to CTC researchers. And I hope that this lecture will sort of uh, cover uh, both groups. And we'll be talking at a pretty basic level, though. And, uh, you know, if there are any questions or areas of uh, clarification, um, certainly we can uh, address those in the question and answer period after the lecture. So what I'd like to do in the next half an hour is um, start with some background information and a key concept. And that key concept is why screening is so effective for colorectal cancer. And as we explain this concept, I think you'll see where CTC is positioned within the screening world. Then we'll turn and look specifically at CTC. What, what exactly is it? We'll look at the literature behind it. We're going to focus on, on two important topics. Whenever you do CTC-based screening, there are questions regarding what is the radiation risk from this procedure and what is the impact of extracolonic findings. Um, there currently is, unfortunately, I think, uh, some misinformation and uh, not a good uh, handle of these uh, issues uh, by the general public, and it, uh, hopefully we can address these uh, issues in this lecture. We'll finish up looking at the role of the radiologist in colorectal cancer screening, and then the status of reimbursement for CTC. So as you know, colorectal cancer is a major public health problem in the U.S. The numbers are pretty staggering, 137,000 cases per year, leading to 50,000 deaths per year. The good news is that it's preventable through screening, but unfortunately, people just do not engage in screening practices. And so it's estimated that 40% of eligible adults are not adherent with colorectal cancer screening. And so there are efforts like uh, the 80% by 2018 campaign led by the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable to hopefully improve these rates for something that really is preventable. So here's the key concept. Um, the key concept of why screening works so well for colorectal cancer. And it's because colorectal cancer has that perfect uh, pathobiology for screening practices. There is a benign target that we can go after, the colorectal polyp that's present in the colon, not for a couple months, not for a couple years, but we're talking for many, many years, a good 10 to 15 years. And so we have this long temporal window in which to screen and intervene if we remove this polyp and uh, disrupt the pathway before it turns into cancer, we can prevent the person from ever getting cancer. Now, if we miss this window for whatever reason and don't screen the person, it turns into cancer, we still have a second window in which to intervene and screen. And this is this window for cure. So if we screen the person and the person already has cancer, if we catch the cancer as an early cancer, before later symptomatic presentation, we improve the person's life. We decrease the, uh, the morbidity as well as uh, the mortality. And if you think about screening for other cancers, such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, when we screen for those cancers, this is where we're screening. We're screening for an early cancer. So if you look at it, colorectal cancer is uh, the perfect cancer for screening because we do screen here, but we also have the opportunity to screen before it turns into cancer. If we can remove this benign lesion, we can prevent the person from ever having cancer. And that's why screening is so important for colorectal cancer and why it's so effective. Now, if you look at the screening mo modalities for colorectal cancer, the stool studies work in this window right here, this window for cure. So when you look at FIT, FOBT, and now stool DNA, these tests try to detect early cancers. They really do not pick up the benign colorectal polyp to any large extent. When you look at colorectal, uh, sorry, optical colonoscopy, it works at this level, but also works in this first window of prevention. And that's why optical colonoscopy is so much more effective than the stool studies because of this ability to detect and remove 
the colorectal polyp. Now the downside for optical colonoscopy is that it is fairly invasive and has a real complication risk and can lead to perforations in a tiny percentage of cases. When you look at CTC and where it fits in this screening world, it uh, is a very effective modality. It works on both the window per for prevention as well as the window for cure. Um, and so it is more effective than stool uh, studies alone. It's equivalent to optical colonoscopy. The benefit is that this is a CT exam. It's an imaging modality. And so the level of invasiveness and the risk of complications is markedly decreased. In fact, the risk of perforation is many orders of magnitude less and near non-existent. Um, the downsides that people talk about with CTC are those related to what exactly is the radiation risk and what is the impact of findings outside of the colon. And that's uh, two topics that we'll talk about later in the lecture. So to continue on with this key concept, we know that colorectal polyps, uh, the vast majority of them, never turn into cancer. And it's only those of a certain subtype, a certain histology, adenomous histology, that potentially can get the genetic abnormalities to turn into cancer. And if you were to just look at the adenomas, which are a subset of all colorectal polyps, only a tiny fraction actually ever undergo all the changes to go to cancer. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? We know that if you look at a generic colorectal polyp, anywhere from perhaps 30% to 50% of the population can have a polyp, but certainly 30 to 50% of the population does not have colorectal cancer. So most of the polyps never undergo this, uh, this transition. However, we know that the, there are a few that do so, and by removing them, it, uh, this screening practice works. Recently, we realized that a second subtype of polyps, hyperplastic polyps, which we always thought were benign and did not turn into cancer, actually belong to a larger family of lesions called serrated polyps, and that there were subtypes that I've outlined in red, and the specific names aren't that important, but these subtypes actually do represent uh, lesions that can go on to cancer and represent a minor pathway to cancer. And this has been something uh, over the last five to eight years has been a real hot topic in colorectal cancer screening and how do we go about to detect and remove these lesions. Okay, so here are the American Cancer Society guidelines uh, from 2008. These are the most recent guidelines. And what they've done is uh, divided those screening tests that detect adenomous polyps will prevent cancer as well as detect cancer versus those tests that primarily detect early cancers. And they say if you have a choice, you should pick from the first list because it is much more effective. And CTC is on that list at done every five years for an average risk individual. So what exactly is CT colonography? It's also known as virtual colonoscopy. Virtual colonoscopy is sort of the lay term used in the uh, press and what have you. CTC or CT colonography is the formal term that is used in the scientific literature. So simply put, it is a low dose non-contrast CT. That's all it is. But then we do hook on a specialized protocol. So the person undergoes a bowel prep. The colon is distended with low pressure carbon dioxide. We scan the person usually twice, once on their back and once again on their stomach. And this creates several imaging data sets that we review. And it will look something like this. And this allows us to go ahead and detect colorectal polyps. So here's a typical case. A 57-year-old average risk screening male at screening CDC. This is our volume 3D map. And this is the endoluminal 3D view. This is the rectal catheter that protrudes in a couple of centimeters into the rectum. It allows us to infuse CO2 to distend the colon. And so um, we can see in the proximal rectum that there's a dome-shaped structure that is suspicious for a colorectal polyp. Now, uh, what we would do in our interpretation is look at the source images and apply certain criteria. And suffice to say that this lesion meets the criteria uh, for a soft tissue polyp, 
it's of a size that we, we would say needs to go and get removed. And so what we would do is we have an integrated program with optical colonoscopy. The person goes to the colonoscopy suite uh, following the CTC procedure and gets this removed. So there's no additional prep. They just move on to uh, the next study. And you can see here that uh, this polyp was removed. This turned out to be a tubulovillus adenoma. And this is what we want uh, to uh, do with our screening programs. Because this is a benign lesion, but it's an adenoma that has a marker with its villus component that says in 5 to 10 to 15 years, this is going to turn into cancer. And by removing this lesion, we prevented this person from having rectal cancer a decade later. Here's a, another patient with a, that new lesion that we just uh, uh, had uh, identified over the last recent years. Be before that, we didn't know that these lesions existed. And this lesion is a flatter lesion. Here it is on optical colonoscopy. This was removed. And again, a great save in the sense that it's a benign lesion. It's something called a sesalcerated adenoma. Um, and this uh, will uh, not uh, be a cancer in the future. Okay, so let's look at the performance of CTC. And, you know, I think it's surprising to know that it's been around for over 20 years since Dave Vining's original um, sort of presentation back in 1994. The feasibility studies occurred in 19, late 1990s, the screening trials in the mid-2000s, the validation trials a couple years after that, and we're currently in a post-validation phase. So when we talk about the feasibility studies, these were proof-of-concept studies that said, can CTC detect a polyp? And so what they did is we created, looked at studies where uh, it was sort of the easiest case scenario, where it was high polyp prevalence. That means most of the exams are going to be positive, and when they're positive, there are going to be multiple uh, polyps. And so this is sort of, the, sort of the easiest case scenario. If the technology is going to work, this is where it's going to work. And what we saw was a sensitivity in the 90% range for polyps 10 millimeters in size or greater. And this is what we wanted to, to see to say, yes, this uh, uh, sort of technology works. So that paved the way for the subsequent screening trials, which occurred a couple of years later. Um, and the first one that came out was uh, the one in the top line. It's the uh, Department of Defense trial led by uh, Perry Pickard. Uh, and uh, you can see we saw excellent results, 94%. Now, unfortunately, there were two multicenter trials that followed it. Cotton and Rocky, which showed really poor results in the 50% range. And so back in the mid-2000s, there was a huge debate in the medical community whether or not you could apply this technology to screen uh, the uh, people uh, that were average risk. So one of the things was the proof of concept was in a high prevalence, polyp prevalence cohort. The screening trials were done in a low polyp prevalence cohort. That means that uh, the number of polyps was decreased and it was equal to an average risk person. And the question is, could you maintain your performance in this harder situation? And we were getting disparate uh, data. Now that we have the validation results, it's obvious uh, to point out the flaws in Cotton and Rocky that led to these poor results. But back then, there was a lot of uh, controversy and debate. And so some of the uh, reasons for Cotton and Rocky that we now know is that, one, they were actually older trials. They started a couple years before the DOD trial. It's just that they took a long time for that trial to finish, and they finished afterwards and came to publication afterwards. The other thing was related to training and experience. What we saw in Cotton and Rocky was that you can see uh, these high numbers here. So we have one institution doing very high numbers, and then this is a multi-center trial, so we had a number of institutions doing very low numbers. And we know that if you do only two CTCs, you just don't have the experience to do it well. And then finally, Cotton Rocky, the readers, the people interpreting the exam, had no training. And there is a real learning curve on the physician side to do this well. So all of this became evident once we saw the results of the validation trial. And the main one here is the National CT Colonography Trial. It's the Akron 6664 protocol. It was published in New England Journal 2008, funded by the NCI NIH. It involved 15 institutions, over 2,500 average risk screening individuals. It employed the latest CTC techniques and hit a sensitivity 
of 90% at the large pulp threshold of 10 uh, millimeters. Other trials included a German trial and a multicenter Italian trial. And again, they saw very similar results in that 90% range. And the general consensus is that you can certainly apply CTC to the screening cohort uh, to detect colorectal polyps. So we're currently in a post-validation phase. And so there's still continued considerable research being done. This is a bibliography compiled by the American Cancer, or sorry, American College of Radiology. And so there's a lot of research being done looking at performance in specific cohorts. So here in an older age cohort, Medicare age cohort, looking at radiation dose, looking at extra clinic funds. So just a ton of research that continues in CTC. And so here are sort of some summary numbers that you could hang your hat on in terms of uh, performance. So when we talk about polyp sensitivity, so now we're talking about cancer prevention. We're removing a benign lesion to prevent cancer. CTC at a 10 millimeter size polyp is 90%. It drops down to essentially 80% at the 6 millimeter threshold. When you look at optical colonoscopy as comparison, it is essentially 90% at 10 millimeters. And where optical colonoscopy starts to outshine CTC is when the polyps get smaller. So at 6 millimeters, it remains 90%. When you look at the stool studies, stool DNA and then FOPT, FIT, you really can't use it for cancer pre uh, prevention. It's not geared toward detecting polyps with a sensitivity of only 2.4%. When you move into that second window, in terms of early cancer detection, all of the screening modalities do great with sensitivities in the mid 90 percent, uh, you know, 95-ish percent range. Okay, so let's move on to two topics that we uh, that always comes up with CTC. One is uh, radiation. So CTC is. Uh, essentially a CT exam, although we use a fraction of the dose of a standard CT uh, exam. So you are exposed to ionizing radiation. And because, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of a scary topic, it's easy to sensationalize. Um, but truly, it is not a concern. And hopefully, after looking at the data, you will agree. So the doses we're talking about when we do CT colonography is 3 milli for exam. And I know this number doesn't really mean much to you, but we'll put it into context in uh, a couple slides. But at these doses, the dose that you do CT colonography, the risk of inducing a cancer 10 to 15, 20 years down the line is completely theoretic. It is predicted by a mathematical model. There is no data out there that supports that at these dose levels, you get increased cancers in the future. So where does this come from? It comes from the World War II uh, experience. And what people said was, when you look at exposures to an atomic bomb, which obviously does not equate to medical imaging, but super high doses, that when you're way up here, that as you increase the dose, you increase future cancers. Um, but where are we truly with medical imaging? We are way over here. So let me enlarge that. So when we talk about medical imaging, we're almost at the zero point. And what they say is if you create this theoretical linear relationship at these super high doses and draw that line back down to medical imaging doses, because that line doesn't cross zero, there is a tiny, tiny risk. So it's a prediction that is based on a mathematical formula, which may or may not exist. But if you look specifically at the data from where this line was generated, 37,000 people received a dose of 5 millisieverts or less, and there were no cancer seen. So the data from where this line was generated says no cancer existed. But the mathematical prediction from the very high doses says that at these doses, you should see it. So people argue that, well, there are confounding variables why you're not seeing the effect. But I guess what I would argue is if you can't see the effect at 37,000 people, it must be a pretty small effect, even if it was real. And I, I would think we would probably need to worry about other 
carcinogens in the environment that have a much larger effect. But realize, even if, if we don't see the effect at 37,000 people, there are other populations we've looked at uh, much larger, like the nuclear industry worker, that have dose exposures higher than what we're talking about. So in this study, 174,000, nearly 175,000 people, no excess cancer seen. We followed people, airline pilots, that get dose exposures higher than what you get from CTC screening. Followed them for five decades, no excess cancer. So there is no empiric data that supports at the dose levels of CTC imaging that you increase a future cancer. And what I tell my patients, to put this into perspective, because it's hard to know um, and kind of get a handle of it, is to say, you know, I think you should look at, at or consider this. So if you look at the exposure, what you receive from background radiation, radon, what have you, for living in Denver versus Washington, D.C., for every year you live in Denver, you get 13 millisieverts of radiation. For every year you live at D.C., you get 3 millisieverts of radiation. So the difference is 10 millisieverts. So a CTC exam is 3 millisieverts. So if we are worried about a future cancer being induced by being in a CTC screening program, we're starting at the age of 50. Every five years until you're 80 years old, you get a CTC. Then you should never consider living in Denver because you will be getting the dose equivalent of three CTCs every year of your life that you live in Denver that you wouldn't have if you lived in D.C. So hopefully that puts it into perspective. Okay, in terms of extraclinic findings, this is the second uh, topic. And again, this is a CT exam, essentially. And so there are diagnoses that we can see outside of the colorectum. And people say, you know, you're going to see a lot of things outside of the colon. People are going to worry about it. You're going to have to work them up. A lot of them are going to turn up negative, but you've now increased the number of exams. You've increased a person's anxiety. You've increased costs. You've increased possible complications. This is a big negative to CTC screening. But you have to really consider that it is a balance between negative and positive. Because even though there are going to be benign, many benign lesions, there are going to be a couple of important lesions that we would want to know in terms of cancers and triple A's, which are abdominal aortic aneurysms. And so really it's the balance. What are the numbers to justify? Is this a true negative or not? So here are the numbers. On the burden side, the extraclinic uh, prevalence is 60 to 70 percent. So that means for every scan, or for every, you know, 60 to 70 percent of people scanned with CTC are going to have a finding. But what we have to realize is that the diagnosis is made right there on the CT, uh, CTC. Those that actually need additional evaluation, uh, that rate drops to 7.4 by 11.4%. Uh, 11 and if you were to then do a medical audit and say, you know, we requested that you needed to work up uh, this exam, that number always drops, series after series, to less than 10%. And the workup rate is somewhere on the order of 6 to 8%. So on the burden side, the additional workup rate is 6 to 8%. And this uh, translates to an additional cost at CTC of 24 to $34. This is balanced by the benefit side. So the extracolonic cancer prevalence is anywhere from 0.3% to 0.6%. Aortic aneurysm prevalence, 0.1% to 0.8%. So what does this translate into? At UW, we've screened over 10,000 patients now. And what we find is for every 250 people that we screen for colon cancer with CTC, we find a patient with an unsuspected cancer outside of the colon. It's typically either kidney cancer or lymphoma. And then for every 200 people, we find an abdominal aortic aneurysm that was unsuspected. And this is huge because when this presents and the person is aware of it with abdominal pain, it likely has ruptured and this uh, has a really high mortality rate. Okay, so now that we've gone through uh, this with CT colonography, I do want to sort of step back and kind of summarize the advantages uh, and weigh it against the disadvantages. So, you know, I would argue that the advantages are that one is highly uh, effective because it can detect both the benign polyps uh, as well as the early cancers. However, it's not as invasive uh, and does not hold the same complication risk 
as other structural screening exams such as colonoscopy, the perforation rate has been uh, reported at 0.005%, which is essentially uh, zero. Um, although uh, we do uh, distend the colon with carbon dioxide um, it, and causes uh, cr a crampy sensation, it really is not uh, painful. And because of that, we do not need to give sedation. And I think from a patient perspective, that is advantageous because you can drive yourself to the CT exam and then drive yourself back. You don't need to get a driver. And then finally, you can answer the screening uh, question with one uh, visit. And the way we do that is we integrate it with optical uh, colonoscopy. One of the questions that people ask is, why would you want to do CT colonography when, when it's positive you need to go on to a second exam, so you essentially have to do two exams? And the reason why is that most of the exams are negative. So in our experience, 9 out of 10 end up with a negative uh, CTC. 1 out of 10 have a sizable polyp that we need to remove, and they go on to polypectomy in the afternoon uh, of the same visit. And so the person does not have to recrime. Now, in terms of the disadvantages, again, it does use low-dose radiation. I would argue there is no data to support at these levels uh, any future increased risk of cancer. But uh, I guess ultimately, um, we don't know for 100%, but I, I would argue there are other things to worry about than radiation. Um, and then secondly, it can generate more workups, but again, there are some positive things that we, we see with that. Okay, uh, turning to the role of the radiologist in screening, and for the general public, I'm not sure if you know uh, about radiologists. Um, you know, a radiologist is a physician that acts more like a consultant and speaks uh, and gives it uh, sort of recommendations to other doctors. So doctors will, you know, work, look at a problem a patient has, order imaging, the radiologist interprets the image and gives recommendations on what is uh, likely going on and how best to proceed at that point. When a radiologist is involved in colorectal cancer screening, I think our role changes where instead of being that consultant to other doctors, we become the primary person responsible for that patient, for that patient's screening help. Um, and so it requires us uh, uh, to have a different set of responsibilities than our typical role. Uh, and I think it's because uh, there are a lot of things that we need to discuss with the patient and make sure that they understand the ramifications of various decisions. So if we have a polyp, is it uh, reasonable to follow it up uh, and uh, image it and see if it regresses or if it gets bigger over time? or do we need to go straight to polypectomy? If there's a discordant case, that is, we see a polyp in the CTC, but they don't see an optical colonoscopy, what do we do at this point? And then in terms of extraclonic findings, how do we go about to manage it? So I think there's a lot of things that changes and increases our responsibility as a radiologist uh, to the patient when we uh, do this. So if a patient misses a follow-up exam, or drops out of routine screening, I think it's our responsibility to contact the patient and get them back into screening. CTC-based screening has a ton of sort of activities that need to be done to do in a quality fashion, and so it really requires a team and a programmatic approach. And so we have uh, a nurse program coordinator, nurse program, or program admin assistants, um, technologists that uh, actually conduct the study and make sure that we get good uh, uh, exams to interpret, and then the radiologist which interprets the exam. So this is our nurse coordinator. These are our admin assistants. They take care of the clinical care list so that we know when people are due for follow-up and if they don't make their re our appointment, we go ahead and start calling patients to get them in. This is our CTE technologist that uh, gets the scan, and then this is a group of physicians radiologists that uh, interpret these uh, scans and talk to the patient. I think that we need to integrate it with colonoscopy. Um, you really have to do same-day polypectomy. So if we see a sizable polyp that needs to be removed, uh, the patient should be able to go ahead and then go to the colonoscopy suite and get it removed that same day. Um, if you have to reprep for it, I just think that's an added step that is not good for the patient. Uh, it should be an equivalent option with screening colonoscopy. So this is the literature that we have at UW Health 
and you can see that uh, CTC is right there with optical colonoscopy. It's on a document that our patients, referring physicians, kind of work together and decide what is the best screening modality for them. Um, I really think that this technology appeals to different people and that optical colonoscopy and virtual colonoscopy used together simply increases screening rates. Um, and so uh, we know that we need to get more people into screening. I think different options um, uh, sort of uh, appeal to different people. And by using kind of a menu of options, we can really uh, increase these rates. Okay, so uh, just to finish up with reimbursement, uh, CTC has been uh, evaluated by a number of external uh, organizations, American Cancer Society, USPSTF, CMS, ECBS, that's Blue Cross Blue Shield Tech Assessment, and then the FDA uh, Radiologic uh, Devices Panel. And uh, aside from the USPSTF, um, all of these organizations say that CTC is ready for uh, uh, colorectal cancer screening. USPSTF gave it an I rating back in, I think, 2008 due to unknowns in radiation and extraclinic findings. There's been an immense amount of research that's done in the interim. So hopefully um, that uh, rating will change. It's in the middle of a reassessment right now. CMS has not covered CTC for screening due to the USPSTF decision. So uh, Medicare is not reimbursed for screening. It is reimbursed for diagnostic indications, and I think it's well sort of uh, trenched, and people have a good comfort level looking at CTC for focused uh, uh, sort of evaluations. In terms of private payers, uh, because uh, uh, there are laws that say that you need to adhere to American Cancer Society guidelines, it's required by law in 26 states. Uh, the trend is that they are increasingly paying for screening and diagnostic this is a partial list of some of the private payers that pay for screening CTC. And I think a nice resource is the ACR uh, web uh, page right here, which lists uh, the various uh, private payers that pay, as well as their policies and statements. It, and it has uh, a number of resources for uh, CT colonography. Pathways to uh, reimbursement, uh, CMS approval through a positive USPSTF assessment uh, is one way. Legislative is another. There are bills in the House and Senate, but it's my understanding that with this climate, political climate, that uh, that passage of these bills would be unlikely. And then always there's the grass, grassroots level, and I, I, I'm hoping that as people become aware of this and start pushing for it, uh, that we can make uh, changes so that uh, people can get reimbursement uh, to use this for colorectal cancer screening. Okay, so in summary, um, CTC holds optimal screening attributes. There's um, documented performance in both trial and clinical settings. Radiation is not a true concern. Um, again, uh, you know, it sounds scary, but at the levels we're talking about, it really does not exist. You're getting a lot more radiation just kind of living life. Extraclinic findings are both a burden and a benefit, and I would argue that what we see in terms of extraclinic cancers and aneurysm greatly outweigh any additional uh, evaluation. There's added responsibility for the radiologists in colorectal cancer screening, and reimbursement is evolving. Um, thank you, uh, and I will uh, turn it over to Kevin, I think, or and look for questions. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, that was amazing, um, and I, I've heard uh, virtual colographies um, presented before, but that was by far um, the best I've ever seen. And um, we we have several attendees that have been posting questions, and uh, at this time we're going to get started with those. Um, first question comes from Shawnee: uh, Can this technology be utilized for those who've had a colectomy? It, it can. Um, you know, early on, uh, probably a decade ago when we were starting in on our clinical experience, there was some concern that if you did not have an ileocecal valve that you wouldn't be able to distend the colon well enough. But uh, 
certainly um, uh, that is not what we've seen in clinical practice is that you can keep the colon well distended. Uh, and so people with colectomies or partial colectomies uh, are eligible uh, for CTC. We can e even do it uh, through an ostomy. Wow. Next, next question uh, comes to us from uh, John. It is the um, why? Why do some patients prefer CTC over colos colonoscopy when the prep is not that different? Or is there a problem better addressed? Is this problem better addressed with education, perhaps, or is there a defining reason? Um, the preps are uh, similar in the sense that in order uh, to do either colonoscopy or CT colonography, you need to do a cathartic um, uh, agent, which means that you need to get, get an agent that cleans out your colon. And people report that that is the worst part of the procedure. So it, it is for both. On the CTC side, we also do give um, some additional um, uh, medications that tag anything that, any residual material. So it helps us with our our um, our uh, our interpretations. Um, unfortunately, currently there's no way around it. It's the same for both. Um, there is uh, uh, research and uh, a lot of effort, and a lot of this is in Europe, looking at um, uh, versions where you don't have to clean out the colon, but you can sim simply do the tagging agents and uh, mix it with the, what stool is there and then electronically subtract it. And it's good, but it's a trade-off. It's not as sensitive as cleaning out the colon uh, completely. And I think, you know, different bowel preps are going to appeal to different uh, people uh, ultimately. So there might be different versions of virtual colonoscopy. Okay, next question uh, comes to us from Catherine. Uh, is there any comment on use of this screening technology on the fact that the highest rising population is the 20 to 34 year olds? Um, you know, I think it's ultimately, uh, I would think of this technology or screening modality being like any other colorectal cancer screening modality so that, you know, if the data showed that it really uh, was uh, a overall benefit in the benefit risk analysis that we screen 24 to uh, the younger population, 20 to 34 year olds, then any one of these menu options should be uh, considered. Um, I don't think that um, preferentially using one modality um, really makes that much difference, if that makes sense. You know, if it was beneficial to, known to be beneficial to screen this younger population, then I think we should apply, you know, a structural modality, either CTC or optical colonoscopy. Okay. The next question we have is from Juan. Uh, does sensitivity increase with stool marking techniques? Um, yeah, I think ultimately the, the where our sensitivity currently is maximized is by cleaning out the, the colon uh, with the cathartic agent. When you do that, though, no matter how well you clean out the colon, there's always a little bit of stool left behind. And the tagging agents are key to mix with it, and it becomes very easy to determine what is residual stool versus a true polyp at CTC. So tagging agents, um, help then to improve sensitivity as well as specificity. So, you know, people say that if you truly want to do uh, CTC with the highest sort of performance, uh, you need to do both. You need to clean out the colon, but then you need to give tagging agents. The next question comes from Raquel. 
Raquel has asked, what is the added cost for the patient having both a CT colonography with a colonoscopy for polyp removal? And I think you touched on this, but can you just touch on it again? And as, Is sure. insurance covering the cost? Um, so, again, uh, the vast majority of CTCs stop at the CTC screen. So um, our statistics are that for every 10 patients, 9 out of 10 uh, are negative or uh, have a polyp where the person, uh, it's reasonable for the person to follow it uh, over time to see whether or not it uh, grows. And so 9 out of the 10 times you can stop right at the CTC, so it's just the single exam. 10% uh, of the time you need to go on and have a sizable polyp that needs to be removed. And so then uh, it is the cost of the CTC and the optical colonoscopy. It's my understanding, and I'm sorry, I don't really get into money, so I don't know for sure, but it's my understanding that currently um, insurance does pay for both, uh, both components. Um, we have local reimbursement for CTC, and so that's covered. And then those people that go on to colonoscopy, it is going to be a second procedure with added cost, uh, but it's my understanding it's covered by insurance as well in that case. All righty. Um, just got a handful of additional questions. We're doing great on time here. Next question is from Jeannie. Uh, since the risk of hyperplastic is now known, should the guidelines be changed from three years to the next scope to versus five years? Well, I think currently, if when you say hyperplastic polyp, uh, and that's all you see, the guidelines are ten years, and I they certainly need to be changed. So any hyperplastic polyp pre two thousand and eight is suspect because there's probably a fraction of those that actually represent that newer entity called sessile serrated polyp, which is that precursor uh, to cancer. So, you know, I would say that if you had a sessile serrated uh, uh, polyp um, and uh, it was 10 millimeters in size, that's probably the same risk equivalent to something that we call, on the adenoma side, an advanced adenoma, and the follow-up should be uh, uh, closer to three years. after removal. Okay. Yvonne would like to know, can this CTC program become a requirement for routine exams like prostate and mammograms? Um, I hope so. I mean, I think CTC uh, is well uh, positioned uh, in terms of screening that, you know, if we can get it uh, into the sort of psyche of the uh, American society that at 50 you get screened and your options are CTC or optical colonoscopy, I think we're going to really uh, decrease um, colon cancer rates. The nice thing about a CTC program is that, you know, you're screening for colorectal cancer, but because it is actually a form of a CT scan, there are other things that we're doing at the same time that we don't really talk about. But one of the things are that actually, even though we say we're screening for colorectal cancer, at the same time we're screening for abdominal aortic aneurysm because we see it on every case. We also, through um, additional post-processing, can measure the bone mineral density uh, of, of the bones and look for osteoporosis. So there are many things that can be screened at the same time, and it's uh, a pretty exciting time for CTC that if it ever got well established, we could expand it and really uh, uh, improve the uh, sort of yield of uh, this examination. And uh, next question comes from uh, Raquel again, and she wants to like to know is, um, do patients receive any sedation during this procedure? They don't. Um, they, uh, so, you know, we used to tell patients early on, this is completely painless, don't worry about it, it's a CT scan. 
And then, you know, now we've had well over a decade of experience and, you know, it does cause discomfort. And so we changed it because, uh, you know, uh, when we talk to patients, we go, you know, listen, what happens is we put a small skinny catheter in your rectum and we insufflate your colon with carbon dioxide. And when we distend up your colon, just like when you have, when your colon is distended because you have to go to the bathroom, you're going to get crampy abdominal pain like you have to go to the bathroom. And so that's what people feel. Um, so there is discomfort, but it's not pain to the point where you need to be sedated for it. It's just that feeling like, oh, I really have to go to the bathroom. Um, and so we do not sedate patients for CTC, and that way you avoid any of the possible complications from sedation. And then from a patient perspective, since you don't get sedation, you can go ahead and drive yourself home from the exam. As opposed to if you get sedation for, for say, colonoscopy, you need to arrange uh, transportation and have someone drive you home. Okay. Next question comes to us from uh, Michael. Um, the question is that uh, he says, I recall that it may be possible to electronically remove stool, so the PrEP may not be necessary. Any comment on that? Yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of research. Um, Mike Zalas uh, just published, well, it's probably three or four years old now, but he published a multi-center trial. Uh, Mike is over at uh, Mass Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, but published a, a trial looking at uh, a non-cathartic approach, which people call prep list, so that you don't have to purge your colon, but you just take all the materials that tag the colon, and then, uh, as the uh, questioner said, um, you electronically subtract it. And what he found was that it was a slight trade-off. That with the current technology, um, it's not, not as good. It's probably very similar for the large polyps, but it's a little bit less. And then once you get to the smaller polyps, we're talking six to nine millimeters, that's where the performance drops off compared to a standard uh, CTC. So it, it's sort of like what people are willing to uh, accept. Are you willing to accept slightly decreased performance, but you don't have to undergo the, prop, the all the difficulties of a prep, or would you want to have that full prep and have uh, increased uh, performance? But certainly that's going to be an option, and hopefully over time as, it, as the technology improves, it might be a primary option, but currently it's not quite there. Okay, um, we have time for just a few more questions here. Is there any standard for CTC at the present in terms of time-wise of exam and methodology of viewing? Uh, yes, the uh, ACR put out uh, sort of uh, quality guidelines um, that, uh, deter, you know, that define what exactly you need to do um, in terms of various steps of the, of the test uh, uh, in order to, uh, to undertake the test. And then there's guidelines for the interpreting physician, what they need to do to make sure that they have the appropriate education to be able to read these exams. Because these exams um, have a learning curve. Um, you need to uh, have a strong foundation in clinical imaging, cross-sectional imaging, and then on top of that, there are specific skills you need to read this uh, well. So uh, the, American, uh, the American College of Radiology have put out these guidelines of what they expect people to do in order to have quality exams. So yes, I definitely that's out there. Okay, and uh, Donna would like to know, is the radiologist there looking and reading the uh, CT at the, sign, at the time of the CTC? Uh, that's, a, that's the way we do it at UW. Um, you know, we think that uh, we need to do real-time results and what we tell our patients, um, it, because what, what happens uh, for our patients are that they come in usually early in the morning, uh, somewhere between 7, perhaps 9 in the morning, uh, and they get the CT scan, CTC scan. It takes about 15 minutes, so they're on the table, they, their colon gets descended, 
they get scanned. The scan itself takes about 10 seconds of breath hold, once on their back, once on their stomach, and they're done. And they give a cell phone number uh, to us, and we said we will call you back uh, within uh, two hours, and usually it's much less than two hours. Uh, but we give ourselves a little cushion, and then we call them up uh, once we've interpreted the scan uh, and say, you know what, uh, it's negative, we'll see you back in five years, you can go ahead and eat. And these people have, you know, spent 15 minutes in the hospital, and most people have gone to work and are waiting and just not, you know, working and not eating until the phone call. And for most of the people, they can go ahead and eat and continue on their work day. Um, for a small percentage, about 10%, we say, you know what, we do see a polyp. We'll get you scheduled for, uh, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock p.m. Um, to get it out. And so then those people come back to the hospital and uh, get that polyp out. And, and Dr. Kim, one of the uh, hot topics currently is the increasing rate of colorectal cancer in the under 50 crowd. And Len has asked if the frequency of colon cancer is increasing in the younger population. Um, what um, are you doing as a colorectal cancer expert to, to help eliminate the misleading guidance that leads some people to wait too long or uh, until age 50 for colon cancer screening? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, cert, the, the guidelines currently say that if you have, you know, a family member with a history of colon cancer, you want to start screening 10 years before the age of that cancer. So, you know, for those people, it may be start screening at 40 or earlier. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, the whole community is looking at these guidelines and deciding, you know, what is reasonable uh, or not. But certainly, I, I agree, we are seeing many more people that are in their late 30s uh, and 40 years old with colon cancer. And, uh, um, unfortunately, I, by the time they present, um, it's uh, usually uh, due to symptoms, and so it's a little bit further on. But yeah, uh, it's certainly something we should be looking at in terms of our guidelines. Okay, and um, last question before we run out of time here. It comes uh, from Carla, and she says, it seems that a CTC program works very well in a university setting where you have the radiology and endoscopy units in the same center. Do you think this would be realistically feasible in a practice? Practice. You know, I, I, I do think that in the community it is very uh, feasible. Um, you know, right now, um, you know, if we screen 10 patients in a morning, that means on average there's going to be one person that needs uh, to have uh, a colonoscopy and a polypectomy, and um, I, I really believe that even in clinical practice it's possible to add these people on um, to the gastroenterology side without disrupting workflows uh, too much, and that this model of an integrated CTC optical colonoscopy um, paradigm can be uh, done uh, without too much uh, disruption. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. It, makes it so that the patient's screening question is answered with a single visit. They don't have to come back a second time to, to, to uh, get a polyp out. They don't have to undergo a second prep. Um, I, I think that on the front end, the logistics and the private side might be a little harder to coordinate, but it can, I, I truly believe it can be done. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, the, I'd like to we're kind of out of time here, but I'd like to thank everyone for all their questions. They were absolutely um, pointed and uh, well worth it and value added. And um, we apologize that we couldn't get to all of them, but we will try um, and answer those questions after the webinar, and after the fact, and get some answers your way. We have your email addresses from where you registered, and we'll try and get those answers back to you. But we're out of time for this evening here. Uh, but before ending the webinar, don't forget to join us for our fifth webinar in the new Colon Cancer Alliance's Conversation About Colon Cancer webinar series, Don't Be a Couch Potato, the Impacts of Physical Activity and Sedentary Behavior on Colon Health, 
which is scheduled for April 15th at 7 p.m. And before we conclude, I would just like to thank both the American College of Radiology and the Medical Imaging and Technology Alliance for their generous sponsorship. And I would also like to personally thank Dr. Kim for tonight's speaker for his highly informative and most excellent presentation. A great job, Dr. Kim. Um, I know how busy you are, and we sincerely appreciate your time this evening. Thank you again, Dr. Kim. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and we sincerely hope you enjoyed this webinar. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and uh, can be available uh, for viewing within a week of the broadcast at ccalliance.org backslash webinars. Look for it there about a week from now. In addition, we'll be posting the top five webinar takeaways and other related information to our blog in the weeks following the webinar check out our blog at ccalliance.org backslash blog. If you'd like to share any comments regarding the webinar, you can always forward them to me at kbergerson at ccalliance.org. That's the email address at the bottom of your screen. And on behalf of the Colon Cancer Alliance and our sponsors, I'd like to once again thank everyone for attending this webinar. I hope you found it informative, value-added, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming.